No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. And today we have producer to the stars, legendary producer who's been doing it for 20 plus years. <laughs> Motherfucking Zaytoven in this bitch. How you doing, bro? Yeah, 20 years. That's, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing good, doing good. That's an understatement though, right? Yeah, well, nah, 20 years just make it sound like a super long time. Has it been 20 years already? It's got to be. You probably, well... well I've been doing it for 20 years, but I wasn't introduced to the game. People didn't really know me to about 2004, 2005, so. So that's when it came up. Yeah, but you've been you've been in music forever. Forever, though. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, let's talk a little bit about your upbringing and stuff. Everybody, uh, or not everybody knows, but some people might know that you are actually born in Germany. How did that uh, come about? Uh, Pops in the military, man. You know, my dad was in the Army, so we moved around, like, really my whole life. So I was born in Germany, Frankfurt, Germany, but I don't remember nothing about it. Mm-hmm. You moved out by what age? Man, I was like a, I was still a baby, I think. Like we was only there. I think my dad said we was only there for an, like another eight months. You know, because like I, I was born. I was just looking at your Wikipedia article, and it's like Zaytoven is a German hip hop producer. Yeah. I'm like, that doesn't really feel <laughs> like it's true, even though it might technically be true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So then your your family relocated to the Bay. Uh well we moved from we moved from Germany then we we uh we went to Columbus Georgia for a while we went to Mississippi Grenada Mississippi Jackson Mississippi then we moved to San Diego California then we moved to the Bay so, so do you remember this being very disturbing to your life like as a child that man I was I I hated it and I loved it I hated moving from all the friends I made. But then I, I, it was something about, you know, moving somewhere new where I don't got to make new friends and do something new. So, you know. It's a really, like, common theme that I feel like I see with a lot of successful people that I talk to is that they either have seen different parts of the world, like, as a young person and stuff. It kind of gets you out of that mentality that you have when you just grow up on the, on the same block and you just see the same people all the time. Like, if you're out in Germany, if you're in San Diego, then you're in the Bay, you sort of are able to see the possibilities. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and, and that's kind of always been sort of uh, something that I've seen through your music and everything is that you've been able to adapt. Adapt, yeah, exactly. And that's why I do. I feel like it's the same way with the music, with you know, with the young artists coming in. It's like I love the guys I've been working with or the guys that helped me create my sound, who I didn't came up with. But I also love working with somebody brand new because it just gave me a new outlook, give me a new flavor. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a, a new love for the game. So Yeah, it's interesting because we actually just happened to have uh, Trippy Red out mm-hmm. back. Exactly. And you guys exchanged and we math. linked up. So you know, you know, that, you know it's going to go on. Yeah. Is yeah. that something that, that stands out to you as exciting is like to be able to work with somebody who's like new and just sort of starting to make their mark in the game? I love it, man, because it it makes me new all over again. And a lot of times it helps me create a sound that I haven't created yet, Mm -hmm. you know, because they 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 got something new to say. They got they like stuff different than, you know, what they what I've been doing for years and years. So they always give me something new, man. Trippy just said, he goes, I've been making rock music lately. And you didn't sound scared of that challenge. You were like, can't wait to do that. Let's do it. Can't wait to do it. That's crazy. Um, so, yeah, okay, so you, you relocate to the Bay, and is that where you spent, like, the majority of your childhood, like, stations? Uh, the Bay is, the reason why I say I'm from the Bay is because where I spent all my high school years. Mm. So all the years before that, you know, I was just a youngster just growing up, but in the Bay is kind of, you know, in high school is where everything stick with you, you mm. know, where you get your game from, where you start learning how you really going to act, you know, you find out what you really love in the, in, in the high school year. So that's why I always represent uh, the Bay Area. But you uh, you grew up in the church a lot? Definitely in the church. Uh, you know, I was in the church ever since I was a, a toddler. So being in church all the time, that's what even got me started with the music. You know, when you're in church all the time, you're looking for something to do. Mm. So I got to be here all the time. So I need to, oh, let me go play with the drums. Oh, let me go play at the organ. You know, so that what really got me musically inclined. Right. Mm-hmm. Were the, what instruments did you learn to play, and did you feel like any of those in particular have had, like, a bigger impact than other things in terms of why you've been able to stay relevant for so long musically? Like, there's, there's a million producers out there. Most of them can't play an instrument. Yeah. Especially now since technology makes it where you don't have to learn how to play anything. Right. But, uh, yeah, that's I think that's a, a big reason why... I've stuck around for so long is because I started off playing the drums, then I, I went to playing the piano. Mm. And both of those, like when you're making a beat, you got to make drums and then you got to make keys. So, you know, those are the two things that that are most important when you're making beats. 
So yeah, I mean the church. I got to give a lot of credit to to me learning to play music in the church. Right. Yeah. When I think about it, like my childhood in the church was mostly just me not wanting to be there and just having a bad <laughs> attitude about it. I wish I had been willing to do something more productive. You know. Yeah. 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 So uh, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Do you feel like that when a producer like like you has like a fuller understanding of what music really is that that's beneficial because a lot of producers just don't have any kind of like musical understanding besides they heard some beats they like them they go and copy them uh definitely i think that's the the reason why i've i've been around for so long is cuz i understand music i understand you know sounds and transitions and and certain tempos and things like that so a lot of times you, you know producers they don't really make it too long because that's all they can do is kind of mimic what they hear somebody else do right so you know so would you remember when you first got interested in hip-hop uh i first got interested in hip-hop i think i was around maybe 10 about 10 years old and i wasn't allowed to listen to music i wasn't allowed to listen to rap because you know it was a whole lot of profanity in the music mm. you know my dad's a preacher my mom is the choir director so i almost had to sneak and listen to it you know i remember my cousin playing dre day for me in his walkman in his headphone i just remember hearing it and i just wanted to hear it just over and over and over again that beat just the mute yeah the song <laughs> just had me stuck like man i almost got addicted to it mm -hmm. so you know so once you know after dre day and the chronic album then the Snoop Dogg, Doggy Style album. So I just started getting like just stuck on the music. Like I couldn't live without listening to the music. So I remember, was, and I was a fan of just all the music. I was a fan of East Coast, West Coast, because I buy every rap album came out. Mm -hmm. I mean, Red Man, Method Man, Bust Around, whatever. I, you know, I'm buying it all because I'm just addicted to the music. And I remember just falling asleep one time at the house and, and you know, left my radio playing. And it was playing like Red Man. Mm -hmm. Red Man had like the nastiest mouth in the world. And my folks came in there like, what in the world are you listening to? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I was I was stuck on it already. Yeah. Right then, yeah. That's funny that you say the, the Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and everything. Because that, that to me like stands out as probably one of the most game-changing time Definitely. periods in music that whole g-funk era that was that was like when i really first started listening to rap and like when you say dre day i just think about that beat and how insanely it sounded like the end of the fucking world, world. that's what i'm saying it was it was addictive it's like almost like a drug it's mm -hmm. like i got to listen to this and it made me so curious about every single thing about what was going on in like los angeles street culture too i was like i have to understand what the fuck they're talking about and what this is all about you know yeah yeah, that's crazy. So, um, did you start when? When did you actually start making beats or, or getting involved? I started making beats in the Bay Area. Now, I used to um, at the high school at the high school games. I used to have my keyboard and my buddy that played the drums. We used to sit there and play like we didn't really have a band. So I sit there and play songs that people hear on the radio or something, mm -hmm. and my guy be playing the drums. So we'd just be piping up the crowd with the keyboard and the drums. The guy uh, J T the bigger figure. You know, in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. he came. You know, he was coming to the games, so he seen me like, "Damn, boy, you dope on that keyboard!" Like, you know, I, you need to come in the studio. So he ended up taking me to the studio and showing me, "Okay, this is an MPC. You hook the MPC up to the keyboard, and this is how you make a beat." And once he showed me that, he'll just leave me there. He'll just go, "All right, I'm gonna go." And I, he'd be gone for hours. So I'm sitting there playing with the drum machine and keyboard, just making beats. I'm making beats just to put on a cassette tape to take it home just to listen like, oh, I made, you know, this is what I've been doing. Yeah. And it was just for fun. I never thought about, oh, I want to be a producer or none of that. It was just I was making the beats because it was fun to me. Then I would go home and let my little brother rap on them or I rap on them, my cousin. You know, we were just doing it for fun. But was J JT was already established in the game at this point? JT the bigger figure was a big dog right. already, you know. He came up, you know, in the era when, when Master P was coming up. So he was like a Bay Area boss. Like, you know, he was running the Bay at the time. And so did he start to have a use for the beats that you were making around that time? And that's when it, it went to, he had an album called Something Kind of Crucial. And I remember one of, one of the beats I did end up being the title track for him on his on his album. Now, he's just a, you know, a Bay Area uh, artist that, that's really kind of selling his music in the Bay. Mm -hmm. So, but to me, that was just such a big plus. It made me feel like, man, I just made, you know, I made, made his album. I wouldn't even, you know, care about money or none of that. I was just, 
I was just geeked up on the fact that I I made a beat on this album and I know everybody around, all my buddies in high school, everybody going to listen to this and know like, dang, Zay, you did a beat on that? Right. That's dope. Yeah, that's crazy. Like that moment where you realize like, oh, I could actually play a role in this. I could actually take exactly. part in the culture. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, were there any other artists you worked with out there? And, and at what at what point did you move, make the move to Atlanta? Was it straight to Atlanta from the Bay? Uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, it was to Atlanta right after the uh, right after the Bay. Cause my dad was retiring, and I guess he wanted to retire somewhere a little bit more subtle, somewhere a little bit more affordable. Mm. So, but you know, when they went to Atlanta, I stayed in San Francisco because I was you know I was doing the music thing now. Like I was selling beats for. Two, three hundred dollars, maybe five hundred dollars, but that's a lot of money, you know. Back then, for you know, my parents worked regular jobs; they weren't making, you know, just a whole lot of money like that. Right. But, but besides the money, it just made me feel a part of something so much. So now that I didn't did J T the Big Figure album, now it's San Quinn, now it's Messy Marv, now it's Be Legit, now it's you know E Forty, you know, it's all these Bay Area guys that. You know that I'm um, I'm doing music with that's making me feel like okay, I'm a part of this right now. Right. So I didn't even want to leave the bay. Right. You, do you ever think that you could have like become so infatuated with that scene and that and that style that you might not have like been open minded enough to get out of there and go do something different? Well, I think I wanted to do something different. After a while, it's like okay, this is cool, but. I started buying my own studio equipment. I remember going to the Guitar Center and putting on Lailway, the MPC 2000, the uh, uh, Triton keyboard. Like this stuff called the MPC was $2,000. The Triton keyboard was like $3,200. So I got to work. You know, I'm working a job offloading trucks. I'm playing music at the church, you know, so they'll give me something from the church. Uh, I was selling beats on the side, so I make a couple hundred dollars. So I was taking every dollar I had to go to try to pay off this equipment because I wanted my own, to make beats at my own spot and, and everything and be able to record. But I couldn't afford to live in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So I was staying at the pastor's house, you know, at the church I was playing at, and it started getting like, okay, Zay, like, it's too much. We can't, you know, we don't have room for all this. So I had to send it. That's when I was like, okay, I got to go to Atlanta now. Mm -hmm. so my parents got a, you know, a basement. They said I can come there. So I'm going to ship all my equipment straight there and start working, you know, out of there. And I felt like, I guess for me moving all my life, I was it was time for me to move again. I wanted to move and do something fresh and something new. So, because a lot of artists sort of get caught up in the bay, and it's like th they'll be real popular out there, but it's kind of hard to break out break from out there. It. Yeah, yeah. And I was I was ready to do something new. Did you have any like interactions with labels or like the official side of the music industry, or were you mostly doing beats for people who were just selling it out the trunk or something? Selling out the trunk. Never, never had interaction with labels. Even as I got bigger, I still, like if you look at my career, it comes from a Gucci man that was probably, you know, that was nobody before we got popping. OJ the Juice Man, he wasn't nobody before we got popping. Uh, Migos, they wasn't nobody really before, you know, we got, I got popping with them. Guys like that, you know, it was guys like Young Ralph, Gorilla Zoe, Young LA, all these guys coming out of Atlanta. I had to keep, make try to make stars out of guys that was from around the way because you know label i felt like labels every, every time i try to send beats to labels or, or or work with somebody that's you know that had deals and stuff already they didn't really like my music or understand my music so interesting and i mean i guess atlanta was different like what year was it when you moved there i moved there like 2000 so it wasn't really popping off like the way we think of atlanta being the the home of hip-hop now nah nah yeah. So, so you get out there and at, at what, what was your parents' opinion of what you had going on in your life? Because, you know, they're in the church. They're probably looking at the guys you're hanging out with, like, what the fuck are these guys doing? Yeah. yeah. Well, it was basically telling me, like, I had the studio in their basement and it was cool for fun. But, you know, my, my, my dad was in the military. So he quick to let you know, like, hey, man, this is not no studio. <laughs> I come down here and throw your keyboard on the ground. Like, like, don't think this is, you know, you need to go go to work. So I was a barber. You know, I started cutting hair, so I went to barber school. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I'd be a barber cut hair because I was doing that anyway in high school. Um, and I was looking at it like, okay, music, I just keep doing it as for, you know, for fun on the side or whatever. So, you know, I went to a barber college, got my barber license, and I was, you know, I was feeling like I'm going to be a barber the rest of my life. You know, music will be something on the side. And, you know, I'd be a barber and a church musician my whole life. 
Who started to give you the idea that you might be able to be a full-time producer? Man, it took forever for me to believe that I could be a full-time producer, even after the hits. After I'm working with Gucci, we got the song So Icy. So, so Icy, like the hottest song that year. Mm. But I felt like it was a fluke. I felt like it was luck. You know, I felt like, this, okay, this probably ain't going to happen again. That's kind of funny. It's like the opposite attitude I hear from a lot of kids these days where they get one hit and they're and they like, feel like, oh, yeah, I'm yeah, lit. I'm, I'm lit. Yeah. <laughs> I can get these face tattoos. I'm never having a job again. Nah, nah. I, I, and I think the reason I felt like that is because I watched my mom and my dad work, you mm. know, their whole life. So I'm used to seeing somebody getting up, going to work. So that's what I felt like I need to do. I got to get up, go to the barbershop. I got to get up, you know, and... and so stability was a big thing for me because I guess that's because, I, you know, that's what I was seeing. Mm. So after So Icy blew up, I still felt like, okay, this ain't going to work. After Make the Trap Say A blew up, you know, this is, now this song did better than Icy did. You know, that was OJ, the song. That was the song. That's when, <laughs> to me, that's when trap music really emerged. Like right. when that was the song, it's like, okay, this real trap music they playing on the radio. Because you had Gucci, who's got, obviously, he's got his flow. And then you got Juice Man. Who no, nobody had ever sounded like that in rap nah, before. Nah. And it just that combination of it was like, yo, this is the weirdest, freakiest, most out-of-the-box hip-hop that we've heard in a while. And it's huge. <laughs> and it's huge. So even after that, you know, I still felt like, man, I, you know, that's another. I got lucky again, mm. you know. Even though I'm really the hottest producer in Atlanta at the time, or really just popping at the time, because I, I could listen to the radio, and it could be four, five songs of mine that just coming on the radio. Mm. And I just felt like that was just a season. Like, I didn't feel like it was going to last that long. I did Usher Papers. Mm. It's the number one song in the country. The, the, the song went number one faster than any one of Usher's other songs. Now, I got the number one song in the country. I'm still at the barbershop all day, every day. What the fuck? That's crazy. Cause I'm still just paranoid. I still feel like, man, this ain't this ain't it. This ain't gonna work. Even though I got the number one song in the country and I done made more money off of this one song than my parents and everybody didn't seen put together. Right. Still felt like I don't think it's gonna last that long. So let me stay, let me stay stable. Let me still cut a hair. Let me still go play music in the church. Cause this is what I know how to do. This is what I know to do. Thank God you got so successful because it would have been a real shame if you had kept cutting hair and sort of not <laughs> put your full energy into music at some point. Well, I was I still was putting all my energy into it. It just I still felt like it was just a season. Right. It took it took to 2013 when I did Versace. It forced me out of the barbershop. That's where, insane because I had known about you for like six years at that point. Exactly. Probably. Yeah, everybody knew. Or like, longer, really. Everybody used to come in there like, bro, why is you still here? Why are you at the barbershop? Like, why are you cutting hair? Even the other barbers mad like, man, listen, we trying to make some money. <laughs> they we know, know, they you know how money. much you got in <laughs> yeah. the bank and shit. They're like, what the <laughs> fuck are you doing? Yeah, but I enjoyed, I enjoyed cutting hair. I enjoyed the atmosphere and it made me feel normal. I like, you know, I like to be Zaytoven, but then I like to be Xavier Dotson, too. I like to be a normal person. I like to be able to walk around the mall, talk to people, and, you know, where not people just rushing up on me, like, ooh, let me take a picture and all that. So it got it turned into that. The barbershop, people would come to the barbershop just to come and take pictures yeah. or, or give me that mixtape or try to get <laughs> signed or something like that. So so when by the time Versace came, I couldn't go to the barbershop no more. Mm -hmm. Damn, that's crazy. So, so we got to. So, who, what artists do you originally start working with, like before Gucci, in terms of your Atlanta timeline? Uh, before Gucci. Anybody notable? Not, not really. Like Gucci was the the first guy, and he was shopping another artist, or yeah, he was shopping his little nephew. You know, he was just a street guy, and like, you know, he knew how to put words together, and he just liked me. He had liked me because I was. You know, I didn't come from there. I was some, from somewhere else. My music sounded a little different. And he was just like, he just thought I was the hardest thing in the world. So like, man, I want to get some song. And my little nephew, I wrote him a song. I want you to make a beat for it. Mm -hmm. And it just went from, you know, him bringing his nephew over to him starting to get in the booth. And it just turned into every day. Say, what's up? Where you at? Man? I'm going to come over. Let's do some song. We're doing three, four songs a day. Mm -hmm just to be doing it because we enjoy each other's company we enjoy i enjoy how he rap and he love how i make beats you and guys just become real friends like in that period of time definitely like we every, we were spent every day together then after doing music all day we meet up and go to the club he might go perform at you know the club called libra or or different places like that so we would each other we with each other 
every day, all day. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's an interesting friendship though because Gucci, I mean, at that time period, notoriously was like fucked up on drugs and stuff. I don't know. Was he like that? Was he partying when you first met him, or was that come with the success? Uh, no. It was. It was. It was a few things that you know. Gucci was in the streets, and I. I wasn't really. You know in that lifestyle of really knowing what was going on that he was doing mm. in the street. So, you know, sometimes it'd be, you know, the Gucci I knew was just my buddy. This is my boy. We'd be recording all day and we go to the club, you know, and record. Then it'd be some other stories or something that he didn't did or something happened. I'm like, dang, Gucci did that. <laughs> but I knew I I knew that before I even met him. I knew he was just one of those guys. So, you know, and I just roll with it. Whatever he was doing, I have you, you know, however it went down. I was with it. Gucci might call me at four o'clock in the morning, leaving the club. Mm-hmm. I said, I need to record. I'm like, man, you, I'm at my mama's house. What you talking about? You need to record. You, you know what I mean? It's, how much, you think my folks gonna let you come in here at four o'clock in the morning and record? But he was so hungry and so determined that, okay, let me sneak him in the back door and keep the music down so we can knock this music out. Cause I felt like he was gonna make it by any means necessary. Right. So if you got somebody like that, that means you gotta stick with them. When you did, you ever have a moment where your uh, strict military family met Gucci Mane, and did, was it a weird uh, interaction? Uh, I it was so many guys coming in and out my house that was you know that looked like they was crazy or in the streets or they smell like you know smoke mm-hmm. so much that she they didn't even know the difference. Right. You know, they didn't really know the difference until our song became you know popular. Did, so when you first heard the way Gucci rap, because he has one of the most distinctive voices probably in rap, and that's the kind of voice that like a lot of people probably heard it. And still to this day, you like, hear people say that Gucci isn't a good rapper and stuff like that just because he has a weird voice or a weird delivery. Like, Did that ever occur to you, or were you kind of convinced from early on, like, yo, this guy's actually dope? First time I started working with him, I thought he was super dope. But nobody else around thought he was dope. Mm-hmm. I go to, you know, to the barbershop and play the music and stuff, and they'll be like, oh, no, nah, you whack. Like, you like him? You think he hard? You, you know what I mean? But I liked it so much. It was just, it was so simple. Like, you know how somebody can somebody can rap real good, and they can say a whole lot of stuff, and it's like, okay, that's cool. Gucci was making stuff that was so simple, but saying all the right words, and it was kind of funny, it was kind of melodic, mm-hmm. but it was still street. It's like I was I fell in love with it. Yeah. I thought it was dope as, the dopest rapper in the world <laughs> to me. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. And so did from early on, did you guys are kind of like known for sort of helping to innovate like the style of making rap songs that people are most comfortable now in terms of you make a beat really fast and uh you know, he would go in there and sort of like almost freestyle songs. Was he ever writing stuff down or was it mostly uh from from the beginning like that? He started he he was when we first started, he was writing songs, but it was it might as well have been a freestyle because he just write he's not even stopping to think about what he's saying. He's just writing, he's just writing, just writing. Then he's like, You ready? All right, I'm ready to go in the booth. It's like, man, you ain't even thought about what you were saying. You just was writing. But that's what got us working the way we did because I know as soon as I start making a beat or playing something, he going to like it and it's, okay, I'm done. I'm ready to go and record the song. Mm-hmm. So it forced me. A lot of times the beats I did early, I felt like I didn't even finish them because I know he was ready to go record so fast. So, But I think that's what helped create the sound that's you know so popping even today. Yeah, that's crazy. So... Did he actually put on any like mixtapes or anything before uh, the Black Tea song, or was it? Did he have anything out like officially? He did. A, he did a. Uh, he did. He was with this. Um, it was some guys around uh, around the neighborhood. It was called Never Again. So you know, we did a. We was doing some songs. I remember the first song we ever did was called Me and My Niggas, and he was rapping totally different than how he rap right now. Mm-hmm. But he was. Just, it was still was just super dope. Then we was rocking with um, Sign Yourself. There was a lot of guys around that I was working with, like Fo Trey and a lot of other guys that's from the neighborhood. And we were just doing songs. So it was a lot of songs before Black T. But when Black T caught, it's like, okay, now people are really talking about Gucci. So right after Black T came, Icy. Right. Uh-huh. Well, with Black T though, was is that just another song too at the time? I know it was like a white. Oh, it, was it was like white a tea. rethinking yeah. white T. That's what it was. Not it like was a like formal a, remix. It um, it wasn't a diss, but it was like you know, it was like making white T a real gutter street song. Mm. And so that, I think that's what really caught people attention. Right, because mm-hmm. the black tea is kind of more like, yo, I'm grimy. Like my well, shirt might get dirty. I can't even do anything about it. The guy was on white tea. They like I do this in my 
my white tee. You know, it's like mm. more happy and fun. Gucci come back and say, I rob in my black tee. He licks in my black tee. So he talking about robbing the whole song. Right. So now it's like, okay, but it, it stirred up the attention that we needed. Right. So then did you already know Jeezy at this point or? Uh, no, I only met Jeezy. I didn't even know who Jeezy was. Gucci was telling me like, man, ooh, young Jeezy want to do a song with us. You know what I mean? And he was happy about it. I didn't really, you know, I was coming from the Bay Area, so I didn't really know, you know, I didn't really know who Jeezy was, but he was the hottest guy coming out. So, you know, Gucci knew more about it. You know, he was in tune with what was going on. So I met Jeezy when we did Icy. Right. Yeah. So that one really went crazy. Was that like your first like huge success? Uh, yeah, definitely. Icy was my first, that's the first time I went to the club, the DJ cut the music off and everybody singing all the words. Mm -hmm. That was probably the greatest experience for me doing this, this whole time. It's cause it, I, I never felt that, you know, it's like when you, the first time you feel that, it's like, it make my heart, it gave me chills. It's making my heart beat fast. Like, man, I'm standing over here in the corner. Don't nobody know I'm the one that did the music, but I'm standing over here in the corner and the DJ turned the music off and everybody just singing a song like, oh, we got a, we got a hit record. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it must have felt crazy. Man, that felt too crazy. Right. But and were you always a person who was comfortable with being the producer, like sort of being in the back and not being as public a person? Because it seems like it kind of fits well with your personality that you never wanted to be the super flashy guy who was acting all crazy and shit. Never wanted to be that. Even when I was making beats earlier, like my little brother would rap. And he's like built to be in front of the camera. Like that's what he, that's what he do. You know what I mean? And I always felt like, ooh, he a star. Let me make all the beats, do all the recording, and and watch him shine on the stage. Mm -hmm. So I always wanted to be, you know, behind the scene. Right. I never been, you know, real talkative. I was kind of quiet. So you know, I never wanted to really be in front of the camera. I noticed that, like, with a lot of producers, especially now, they kind of have that uh, disgruntled vibe sometimes about the fact that the the artists get so much attention and that they don't get as much play. Uh, you seem like the kind of guy that was always like, you sort of wanted that to be the situation. I want it. Yeah. Dude, so is is it weird, like, coming from like you never drank or smoked or got into any of stuff like that? I never even tried it. Never even tried it. Was yeah. you just new from uh, day one, even with hanging out with all these guys, and you never wanted to give it a go? Well, I, I had a solid foundation with my parents. But a lot of people do, and then it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, just, <laughs> a lot of times it's the other way around, the people that, you know. But I I guess that's just, it's, it's just been my character, I think, mixed with, you know, looking up to my parents and, and, and how they raised us and everything. I just was that type of guy. And then being in church, as much as I was being in church, it was something that was instilled in me to be like, okay, that ain't for me. That ain't my life. That ain't what I want to do. Mm -hmm. This is what I do. I go to church. I play the keyboard. I, you know, I, this is what I do. So when the when the other stuff came, when it, you know, when all the guys around me that that smoke or drink or do whatever they do, I never felt pressured to do none of that because it's like that ain't me. That ain't, I don't even want to really try it. You know. And realistically, it's like you know, you don't want your producer to be getting fucked up well, it's usually <laughs> not good for business you know i was i feel like telling kids that when i see like the manager and the manager's doing zans and stuff yeah, it's yeah, like it's too much. It's yeah too just because the rapper's doing zans doesn't mean he wants you to be doing, doing that probably it, yeah. that's not going to work out great long term because see gucci now now when that's be the first thing gucci will introduce me to people and the first thing he'll say is Oh, this my producer they told me he don't drink, he don't smoke. You know, he that's he immediately going into that. Right. And I'm like, bro, you ain't got I don't you don't gotta do that. You know what I mean? That's almost embarrassing. Like, you don't do that. Right. But he was so, I guess, proud. Even though this is, you know, Gucci is the is the, you know, the streetest guy you gonna meet. Right. Especially at this time. So for him to go in immediately and start bragging on my characteristics, it made me feel like, oh well. He he's proud of that. He's bragging on that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it made me feel confident in how how I am yeah. around anybody, whatever they do. Around killers, I feel confident. You know, I f I'm comfortable. Right. Because you know I mean? at the end of the day, people want to see you be yourself. Be yourself. They yeah. don't really like. It doesn't matter if you you are what you are. And it's like you could have like the the squarest, nerdiest dude with you, and it's all good. Nobody's gonna be judging him. Yep. But then as soon as he starts trying to act, act like, like he's like something he's not, everybody's yeah, like, yeah. Yep. yeah, I don't know. That's exactly. Yeah, that's crazy. Did you ever uh, get into it with Gucci? Like, I always would hear stories about him and Waka fighting and shit mm -hmm. like this. You ever, like, butt heads? Yeah, we bumped heads a few times. Uh, I remember bumping heads with him. Kind of, it was a, a friend of mine, like a real close friend of mine named Wiz. And it was, 
it just something that escalated that and we was in the studio and they kind of getting into it, you know what I mean, at at my house. Mm -hmm. And it's like, hey, bro, you got to leave because you just said something too disrespectful. <laughs> and it was so funny because Gucci a dude like Gucci is the funniest guy in the world because he'll go off on my boy to get into it. Then I'm like, bro, you can leave my house. You ain't got to come back here, this and that. He'll go outside and call me. He in the car on the phone. Oh, so we ain't boys no more? <laughs> you know, after we done had like a real heated conversation. So, you know what I mean? You know, so anytime we bumped head, it was only for, you know, for a few minutes. It was a short period of time. Yeah, that's like a good personality trait to like be willing to just like face up to a conflict real yeah. close to it and just get up in it. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that helps. Like same thing in a relationship. Like, you don't want to like fight for days. Forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah. You could fight for an hour, but yeah. like don't go to bed mad at her, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's crazy. All right. So, so, so IG starts exploding. Uh, from your perspective, did that change things for you or were you just sort of like amazed and you wanted to keep working on stuff? Uh, for me, it really didn't change anything. Mm -hmm. I was almost hurt. I remember that that's when 106 and Park was was uh, was on. And I was I remember sitting in front of TV like, oh, the video finna come on. Mm -hmm. You know, and they and they'll go ask the audience like, well, what you think about the song and this and that? And they're just like, they was everybody that they talked to, they didn't like it. Really? They'll say, oh, the beat was dope, but the song was whack. Or, you know what I mean? I was just like, oh, like, why they do me like, why they do but us like that? that's New York, too, right? Huh? Yeah, that was in New York. So that's going to, it's going to take them a longer period of time, I really. I didn't understand that, though. I just felt like, oh, why would they do that? We got the hottest song in the world. Like, you can tell our song was the hottest, you know, thing moving. Mm -hmm. But it didn't really change anything for me because at the time, Gucci was really hated. Like, they didn't really like Gucci because... Jeezy was the new popping guy, mm. and now they bumping heads on the Gucci song. Gucci was the villain, straight He's up. He's the villain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so for me, it's like I can work with Gucci or some new guys that's coming up, you know, from around the neighborhood, but there's nobody that's knocking my door down like, ooh, Zay told me we want some beats. Oh, they thought you must be fucked up because you were hanging out with this crazy dude? Well, it's, yeah, it's like, you, oh, you Gucci, you you Gucci producer? Okay, no, nah, we, don't, we don't want no beats. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's crazy to think of a time period where he was the devil like that yeah, to people. Yeah, that's how it was. That's crazy. But that's what made him so successful, and that's what made, you know, put the stamp on him how it is now. Now he's like a superhero to the type of music that, you know, that everybody's doing right now. Yeah, that is fucking crazy. So that song blows up, and then were, were you involved at all with, in the Gucci Jeezy beef? Like, what was that like from your perspective that sort of unfolded from that song? Uh, it was crazy for me because I'm still at the barbershop, and... The paperwork hasn't been signed off on. You know, you got to do split sheets and mm. everything with the song. So, you know, Jeezy and them, they was going to use it on his album. What was, it? What was his first album? Uh, was it uh, Trapper Die one? Uh, no, no, it was um, Thug Motivation 101. Okay. Is that, is yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they was going to use it. On, you know, I was hoping that they both was going to be able to use it. Like, okay, ooh, that's going to go on Jeezy album. I know that's going to go platinum. And then it can go on Gucci album, Trap House. But they was bumping heads, so it came down to it as in saying, like, well, Zay, whose song is going to be? It got to be somebody's song. Is it Jeezy's song or is it a Gucci Man song? Mm -hmm. Now, Jeezy and them, they was trying to, you know, get it to put on it, on their project. But I was like, man, I can't I can't sign to let y'all use it because Gucci is my guy. And Gucci is the guy that come to my house and, we, you know, we built this thing from scratch. And I know the type of person Gucci is. Mm -hmm. You know, it probably would have been a bigger money play on the Jeezy side, but it was like, you know, and it, I felt like, dang, if Jeezy used it for a single, this going to be super big. Mm. But I couldn't do it because it's like, no, nah, I got, me and Gucci got ties, and that song, that's how we, we made that song together. So, yeah, I was in it at that <coughs> point. I was having the guys, Gucci calling me like, hey, man, don't don't sell my don't sell my song to nobody, and then I'm having, you know, Jeezy people calling like, hey, you know, let, let us come pick you up on the barbershop. Let's work this stuff out. I'm like, man. So I was, I couldn't really enjoy it because, you know, because what was going on. It was it's kind of amazing that you managed to like make it through a lot of situations like that, presumably over the years, without really getting into it yourself. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. Probably says a lot about like how people view you personality-wise. Because I mean, you hear stories about producers getting fucked up here and there. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's crazy. So from there, did, did you continue to like work mostly with Gucci, or like how did you start to expand out into working with other people after that? It was it was still pretty much Gucci. Like you know, after that, Gucci got the case and was locked up for mm -hmm. for a while. 
So I started putting out the music that we had. Like me and Gucci was recording music all the time. So I remember making mixtapes like uh, Ice Attack, you know, mm-hmm. Ice Attack Part Two. Like you know, I was making mixtapes while he was locked up just to keep the music going. It's like, dang, we had a, hit, a big song, so I don't want to just let the whole career, everything just die out because mm-hmm. he's locked up. And then we did the album while he was locked up. We did um, uh, Hard to Kill. Mm-hmm. So Hard to Kill was like one of those albums that I think made other people listen and be like, hold on, they told the truth. Right. You know, we need to start. I, we, I want to get some beats from Zaytoven. Mm-hmm. So I think people start, you know, you know, respecting me differently after that project came out because I executive produced the Hard to Kill, and I did ninety percent of the production on it. So um, that's when I, you know, I started working with like an OJ the Juice man. I still got to build artists from ground zero. There's there's still not no big guy just knocking my dough down. So. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, so OJ started being popping. He's a new guy from the neighborhood that started making noise. Do you think he started making noise like because Gucci was gone? That that sort of opened up a, a room? Because that's what people always say is that when Gucci went, goes to jail, somebody else in the city pops off, like mm-hmm. Waka, yeah, yeah. Migos, et cetera. Yeah, like they yeah. all kind of yeah. came up in that time where Gucci couldn't be just running mm-hmm. shit. Yep, yep. It definitely was that. And it, and it let me put focus on OJ. I mm-hmm. felt like, well, dang, Gucci gone right now. So, and, you know, me and Juice is just working. All his first, what was it, three, four mixtapes. Every song produced by Zaytoven. So I'm just working with him like I was working with Gucci. So, you know, so so when Gucci get out and then, you know, they start working together, now it's like we got like a, a dynasty. Mm-hmm. You got Zaytoven, Gucci, and, and OJ with Make the Traps A.A. Now it's like, okay, now we run the sound. Like we was running the sound of Atlanta with that. Right. You know, the sound, the music that we was putting out was running Atlanta. Did, so. did Juice Man's style blow you away when you first heard it? Did it take you a while to like get used to it? Well, OJ rapped on a, a beat. I didn't even give him a beat. He was rocking with the guys I told you that Gucci was rocking with at first called Never Again. Mm-hmm. So they had a lot of my beats over there. I just give them beats or make beats over there. And Juice had just got out of jail. So he did a song called Everything On Me. And everybody loved it. He was going to the club performing it. Everybody going crazy over it. So I'm like, oh, Juice, he the guy. So... Uh, now, at that time he wasn't doing the hey he wasn't he wasn't really rapping like that. You right. know? So I think he kind of found that sound just in the midst of us working so much. He started trying some things, and and when he started coming with the a, and people started liking it, I felt like okay, this is a niche. This is a like a gimmick that'll definitely work because he exciting. He like Gucci was more boss and laid back and rapping real street and 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 what or whatever. But Juice had like an excitement about him. He light skinned, he's short, he jumping up and down, and he, now he's going, hey, okay, all that. So it just brought another energy that I felt like, okay, he a star. Yeah. Even I always though, felt like it was like a crime that they didn't really like keep working together for that long at that man, time that period, just, you know? Like, that was my favorite. With me, Gucci, and OJ, it was just unbeatable. I had a chance to meet him a couple months ago, and it was just... This presence is just like, I, do you agree with, I remember seeing an interview with Walker's mom on Breakfast Club like a few years ago, and she said that like the main thing that she felt bad about in her career was that because of whatever she was going through, that she didn't really have a chance to push OJ the way that she wanted to. OJ is one of them, and his character, like, you know, Juice, not only was he, like, Juice was a real, you know, we really in the streets for real, so, you know, plus, man, Juice remind me, our my memories of Juice is, I didn't really know him, but we can go to the club, whatever it is. He going to buy and do whatever. Zay, what you need? I'm going to buy you this and that. Oh, we at the strip club? Here, I'm going to get you some dances. Like, that's how he just treated me. Mm. So, like, I just rock with Juice so much that I was just rooting for Juice just to be, like, the biggest in the world. Right. You know what I mean? He should have been bigger than he probably was. And you still put on. You oh, had a, still, this is my guy. He on my new single. With you know, the, like. Ty Dolla and everything, right? That's one guy. It don't matter, you know. How big I get or what's going on, he's one of the guys that I'm always going to include him, whatever I'm doing. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, we got a long list of other artists that you worked with around that time. But, okay, so with OJ, who who did you really work start working with after that? OJ, I started working with the guy Young L.A. Right. Uh-huh. And Young that was kind of like your artist? Yeah, it's like my artist. It's like a guy brought him to me to... to pay for some beats for him, but I just... He was so dope. He turned into, like, my little brother. He turned into, like... You know, a guy that's like, okay, he's just over here every day, all day. He might spend the night, you know. But he's super dope. So, you know, he it's, it's him. And then it turned into Young Ralph. And then 
uh, Gorilla Zoe at that time, uh, guys like Jay Money at that time, you know. So. With, some, with somebody like Young L.A. in particular, like, what do you think went wrong with that? Like, it seemed like he was going to blow up for a while. He had that huge song, mm -hmm. and then it just didn't seem like it kind of worked out from there. Uh, I, I can't really say. It's like, you know, a lot of it has to do with, you know, sometimes what they have going on in the streets. Sometimes they can get in situations where they really didn't should have waited before they got into the situation. Mm -hmm. So I think all that played a part. Then he started kind of getting locked up here and there. You know, a lot of times... You know, if you get gone at the wrong time, mm. it can really just devastate your career. Yeah, it's crazy how fickle the industry is. It is. It is. Did you, do you feel like you really started learning about the music industry and, like, how to navigate that shit at a certain point? Or was that just, like, a slow learning process? Slow learning process. Because I was still doing everything from the mud. I was still just trying to create. Like, I wasn't even caring about the music business for real. I was just caring about... I was trying to chase that high of... Okay, we had the hottest song in the world, so I'm just trying to chase that feeling again. Mm. So me working with all these new artists, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to just create the the feeling of, okay, Zay on fire with the beats. Even to this day, I'm it's, it's like the same high I'm chasing. I chase the same high. Mm -hmm. Like, all I care about is Zay the truth with the beats. Zay, Zay told me the dope, you know, he the dopest with the beats. Yeah. And that's that's really what I, I that's all I really care about. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Um. So, at, at what point did the Migos uh, come in? Uh, Young L.A. is the reason I even rock with uh, the Migos. Because mm -hmm. he came to the house and he was like, Zay, man, I just heard some little young dudes rapping on your beat saying bando or something. He said, man, ain't going crazy. And I respect his opinion so much. If he tell me somebody going crazy, mm -hmm. I'm immediately going to look it up. I look up uh, bando and his Quavo rapping just like in the living room or something, like a ceiling fan going, he just uh, trapped out the band, though. You could hear the ceiling fan or you could I mean, see you it in the see, video? Oh, see, okay. see, yeah, in the video, it's like, you know, just him rapping in, in, you know, into a camera. Like, it might have been a cell phone or something he was rapping into. Yeah. But I just immediately, just listening to it and looking at him, I was like, he's a star. Right. He was, I, I want to find him. So it went from there to they had a little video for Bando. Mm -hmm. Now, when I see the video for Bando, I'm showing Scooter. Hey, Scooter, come look at these dudes right here. Gucci, come look at these dudes right here. Mm -hmm. That's You know what I mean? I'm showing them because I'm like, man, these, they dope. The reason why I think they were so dope to me is because the beat sounded like something Gucci would rap on, and they kind of sounded like Gucci, man, rapping on it. So Gucci was the only guy that I showed that to that was like, Zay, you need to find them. Mm -hmm. They dope. Everybody else like, uh, that ain't you. That's hard to you. That's all that you know. That's how everybody treated it. Like that ain't really that hard, Zay. Like, you know what I mean? But Young LA told me they going crazy, and Gucci seen it and said, "Hey man, you need to find them. They going. They going crazy." Yeah. Was there anything about their them at that time? Like, I mean, when you really look at the Migos success, it's like the craziest thing ever. Like, yeah. it's gone so far. Even even compared to somebody like Gucci, Gucci's one of the biggest rappers out. But Migos are yeah, on a totally yeah. different, different level than almost everybody at this point. Yeah, yeah. And with and for such a huge amount of time, they got like ten years practically that they've been absolutely like killing the game. And that's like when we first heard Migos, like me as a fan and stuff, I thought it was cool, but I also thought it was maybe kind of a gimmick. Yeah. I, I didn't yeah. really see it panning out in a super long-term thing. I feel like a lot of people felt that way. But Yeah, it, it was like that. It was, at, it was at a point where, I remember when they put out their first album and it really didn't do so well. It was like, dang, is the is people tired of the Migos? Is it over with for the Migos right mm -hmm. now? You know, I'm not sure. You know, they my guys. I'm always working with them. But, I, you know, I, I kind of felt like, dang, it might not last as long as now they didn't got bigger than I ever thought they was going to be. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, was so? Did you ever like attempt to sign them, or assign, were you, have you always been like interested in signing artists, or has that come much later? All these guys to me were my artists. Like mm -hmm. when I met Migos, I immediately said, "You know what, y'all, let's let's exchange numbers. Come to my house." They came to my house the next day, and they came cocky. Like you know, I remember I was recording El Dorado Red in the house. Ooh. You know. When they came Drug over. dealing music. <laughs> that was good shit. Yeah, I remember hey, that yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had El Dorado in the, so we in recording. So I told him, all right, yeah, y'all chilling over there. You know, watch TV or something for me. Let me finish recording him. But they itching to get in the booth. 
And what me and El Dorado doing is hard. It's super hard. And I'm like, boy, I know y'all like that. It's just hard. They're like, yeah, that's yeah, that's hard. You know, they ain't, <laughs> you know, they just saying they was just itching to show show me what they got. You know, that's how they felt. So we immediately, uh, they they uh, they played me some of the music they already had. But I was like, you know, let's just start making some music from scratch. Mm -hmm. So we started recording from scratch right then. El Dorado left. Me and Migo just at my house just recording. So we did some songs, and then I gave him some beats to go home with. Versace was one of the beats that, you know, I gave him at that time. So it was just like, you know, just, I guess that, just seeing where they at right now coming from that right there, it's just, it's just amazing. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. I also just want to point out that I said drug dealing music. It was actually drug dealer hip hop. Yeah, the Eldorado Red song. You might have been confused for a second what I meant. Man, Eldorado was so hard. And we working, I'm still working with Eldorado. For real? Yes, sir. Do you, you tend to like stay in touch with the dudes that you... Anybody that had anything to do with my success or my sound, because I feel like all these guys help create the sounds that I have, you know? So I always, man, I stay <clears> in touch with them and we work, you know, we're going to work till it's all over with. Yeah. I got to ask about how you met Scooter and everything, too, because he's always been one of my favorite rappers. And he's another dude that I feel like he could have been bigger than he got, and he somehow didn't really work out. But he's just, like, a fascinating persona to me. Scooter was... It's so crazy now. Scooter and Future. Mm. Both was rapping on my beats when I didn't never... You know, they wasn't nobody. This is when Gucci popping and my beats are floating all the way around the city. I remember meeting Scooter at... Stonecrest Mall where I was couldn't hear it. And he was walking out and I was walking in. And he was like, hey, man, I did a song on your beat, bro. I, want, I need to let you hear it. You know what I mean? And it was so crazy. One of the beats that I rapped on, I remember I used to be trying to rap, so I rapped on the same beat that he told, that he let me hear that he rapped on. And I, okay, that sounds good. That's dope. So it, it, it wasn't until maybe a year later when me and Scooter really clicked where he was coming over my house and me and Scooter, like, you know, we was like this every day. Scooter at my house, we recording every day, all day. It's just, you know, Scooter walking around with his Beethoven beat shirt on. Mm. Like, this is like my artist. Even though he was already working with, you know, Future and everybody else, it just like, this is my guy. I think this is why Gucci got in tune with him so much, because Gucci had called me. He's like, man, that music that you and Scooter doing sound almost harder than music me and you used to be doing. So, you know, and then I start seeing Gucci with Scooter all the time. Mm. So, you know, and that's and that's how, you know, me and Scooter got so tight. But I met him at Stonecrest Mall and he rapped on my beat. Most of the guys I met that, that got big, they rapped on my music before I knew who they was and I didn't give them the music. They got it from somewhere else. Right. How would they get it? If it was from the studio or the homie? I was giving out beat CDs that had 40 beats on them just to everybody. Even after Gucci was going crazy and shit, you didn't like care. Like I said, because I, I still don't know if this is going to last. I don't know how it's going to pan out. Right. I'm still, you know, so I'm just giving out beats to everybody. Everybody I think that's halfway dope, they got a CD with, you know, with 40 beats on it. Mm -hmm. Now, they might leave that at some other studio, so them beats all over there. They didn't got it from somebody else, so everybody just getting beats. A lot of my songs came from, dang, I didn't give him that beat, but he just made a hit to it, so... You know, I, I feel like that's why I kept doing it. Yeah, that's, that's like, crazy. That's like now. I'm going to send out like Trippy Red we just met. I'm going to load him up with beats. Now, hit them beats. Matter of fact, I don't know who the guy was out there. He just told me like, hey, man, I did a song on one of your beats. I want you to hear it. When RC, I see Narco. Yeah. He just so, signed him. That's what I'm saying. So, like, I don't know where he got the beat from. I don't even care. I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted the music to be dope. But if that, that uh, song comes out and, and blow up now. Then you, you know, care. Then it's like, uh, <laughs> That's it. Yeah, your man's crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's what that's the, that's the amazing part. This, you know, this. Yeah, so. right. That's fire. Um, mm -hmm. I gotta ask about how you met Future too, because the fact that you did the, the you did what half the songs on Beast Mode, or did you do the whole I thing? I did the whole thing. The whole thing. That's insane. That's yeah. a big part of history, right man, there. That's that's like my favorite project in the world. Yeah. Now I met Future. I was on Future on every one of Future's mixtapes, include. I think I'm the only pro producer that's been on Future first. 1,000 mixtape, mm. but I didn't give him the beat. You know, this is back. I didn't really know him. I was I was a hot producer at the time, so he used my beat on on 1,000 mixtape. Then he came out with Dirty Sprite. Mm. <clears throat> and I did like three songs <laughs> on Dirty Sprite. But I remember him calling me. Uh, I forgot how we linked up. He was calling me like to let me hear the songs, like the beats he used. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's dope. 
But then Dirty Sprite came out and it was just the hottest music in the world. Mm -hmm. Like that's all anybody could listen to. So then I started paying future attention like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, you the truth. So now I'm giving them beats. Just, you know, let me give you some beats. Let me just send you some beats. So I was on every mixtape after that. Now when it came down to him doing his albums, uh, was it Pluto and then... First one was Pluto, right? Pluto and then... Was it Honest after that? Yeah, and Honest was the one that people didn't generally like. Well, I, I, I didn't work with him on Pluto or Honest. Mm. So we kind of just kind of lost touch. And I'm like, you know, that it gets like that sometimes. Sometimes he might find other producers or a different sound. It's like, okay, that's what he's going with. So when he did those parts, I didn't talk to Future for, you know, two years, a year and a half, two years. That's got to kind of feel good, though, to see an artist like go and try to do something else and then it doesn't work out that well and then he comes back and then you make a project that's like a certified classic. so many times. Really? But, like, so when he came back with Monster and I was, I was hearing in the streets like, oh, Future kind of going back hard. You know, mm -hmm. he, you know what I mean? He kind of going hard. This is, you know, this is after why I done had Migos blow up, I got Dolph blow, you know, all these guys I've been working with was blowing up. At the time, he wasn't really, at, you know, really that relevant. Mm -hmm. So I remember after Monster was going, then he, he called me to the studio, like, man, I want you to hear, mind you again, I don't even know for sure where you got these beats from, because I wasn't rock. I ain't talked to him in a long time. He's like, I want you to come to the studio, listen to these uh, songs I did to your beat. So it was like four or five songs. So we in the studio, and I'm like, ooh, this, you know, junk going crazy. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of people in the studio, and they in the studio like, man, you just need to do all Zay. Like, you need to put out another project, just do all Zay. Now, Future ain't never did no project with no other producer where they did all the beats, even to this day. There's no project he has where one producer did every beat on the project. Mm -hmm. So uh, once, I, once I found out, like, okay, he wanted to do a project with me, I started making beats that... I felt like, because Future gave me the, he said to me, like, Zay, whatever beats you give me, I'm rapping on. Mm -hmm. So he's telling me, I'm not in charge of what beats I'm going to rap on. It's whatever you make, <clears throat> that's what I'm going to rap on. So when he told me that, it made me, if you listen to Beast Mode, none of my music before Beast Mode sounded like Beast Mode. Right. You know, now you hear all these pianos and, and melodies and, and instrumentation. It's because he told me, Whatever beats you bring me, them the beats we use, and that's what we rapping on. That's right. what I'm gonna rap on. So now I'm going home making beats that's like, oh, okay, this is a chance for me to get out of the the normal Zayto and everybody know and start making it like, dang, what Zayta made some some cold beats, you know what <laughs> I mean, for future. So and I think that's why Beast Mode was so special because I, I had the liberty to, the liberty of, oh, you telling me. You know, cause most rappers, when they do a project, it's like, okay, say I like this beat. I want to use that one and this one. Right. It's another thing to say, whatever you give me to rap on, that's what I'm rapping on. He followed up on that, though? Like, he really did rap over the weirdest beats you gave him? He rapped on every beat I gave him. He didn't skip one beat. If I brought 10 beats in, he rapping on all 10 of them. And was that, how many songs do you, you think you made before Man. the album was figured out? A hundred? About a hundred songs. Yep. So, and it was so hard to just go through and pick the ones because it's so much dope that we got. That we done. Did you feel it on him right then that he had a he really had something to prove and that he was like motivated to to get back what he had kind of lost at that point? I really didn't feel it till I was almost nervous. I was kind of scared because I'm like, okay, future just now getting back, you know, trying to get back popping, and now I'm doing a full project. So people are gonna be looking at me if this ain't really that hard, or people, you know, they still gonna be looking at oh, Zay Tovin did that whole project. That wasn't really that that good. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of nervous at the time, like, man, I don't, you know, I'm hoping the people receive it the right way. Right. So after it came out, that's when I started seeing, like, oh, wait a minute. People call, other rappers call me, like, hey, bro, y'all got the hardest, y'all got the hardest project in the world. Right. Like, y'all done set the world on fire with this. So, and he had called me and, like, Zay, man, you know what, bro, I really appreciate you. We, we just made history with this. He was letting me know that when I go perform my shows now, I don't got to do no old songs. I can just do this music that we did, and people, you know, they love it. That's crazy. That's so, true. and then I got confident, like, oh, okay, now I'm like, can't nobody, you know, they can't beat me doing these beats. <laughs> <laughs> that is starting yeah. to really get to you. So yeah, it's about to get to me. I got to ask, like, around uh, that time period, was was that when you, like, really started to get more into, like, the industry in a sense? Like, you started working with Usher. You started working with all these different artists that are, like, on a different level. You started getting stuff lined up by the labels or? No, sir. 
I had worked with Usher before. Uh, oh, on the Gucci Be- song. Huh? On the Gucci collaboration or No, no, I did Usher his single though, but that was before oh, right. we did Beast Mode. Okay. Yeah, so I think even even after I did Usher, people still looked at me as okay, you Gucci man producer, right? You don't want to make Gucci beats, right? Mhm. I'm like, well, no, I did Usher. I got number one song in the country. Yeah, that's cool, <laughs> but you do Gucci Man beat. <laughs> right. Like, they didn't care about that, you know? So even to this day, people still don't look at that as like, okay, Zay Tobin did that. They still stuck on, even now, they still stuck on, oh, you you make Gucci Man beats. You the one make Gucci Man beats, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's weird. Like, with people who don't really know about rap that I was explaining, like, like who are you interviewing? I'm like, Zay Tobin, he's like the dude that, made well not made gucci but he was like the the beginning of gucci <laughs> man like you know it's like it's hard as a producer to like really be able to like focus in because there's so many artists that you worked with that are notable and that you made big ass moments with yeah. but it's tough to like really boil it down to something simple like yeah. that future mixtape could get left out of the conversation yeah it can get left out just because okay and i think the reason why is because the sound that i made with gucci in the beginning is the sound that's getting mimicked and mm. copied so much right now. So people still look at me as in, oh, he Zay Tobin is the guy that created that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like the same way that like three six, like they keep having their fucking name re- rejuvenated. Mm-hmm. When that Cardi B album came out and they had the whole the uh, remix of like the uh, old three six song or Chicken Head, it's like, oh my God, like it's just another reminder that that sound that was really important at that time was so important that we're gonna keep being reminded of it like over and over for the next hundred years, however long. Man, listen, I do DJ sets now, and one of the most popular songs I play is "Slide on My Knob" by three six. You know what I mean? So that's crazy that you know. Any, they can do everything new that they want to and, and get, you know, some accolades for anything new, but they still going to be known as, well, they the one did the slob on my knob song. And just when you started <laughs> to think that the slob on my knob might have gotten, like, sort of forgotten, Future comes out and brings it back Bring on that right Kendrick in. song, yeah, and yeah. now it's it's, it's all... all over again. It's, 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 it's <laughs> popping all over again. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, there's one I, I know this is your manager and your lady friend have uh, stood up, so I just want to... I figure we're kind of on tight time here, but I did want to ask about... The Gucci, like, okay, so he gets locked up. Were you guys super tight around that time period where he was in, like, the, the it was the Brick Factory at the time? Mm-hmm. And he was kind of, he was going really hard, like, musically for a while, but also, like, his personal life was all up in the air, sort of unfolds with this whole crazy Twitter meltdown and everything. Then he gets locked up. Where were you in his life at that time? I was there. I was at the Brick Factory okay. every day. Was that insane? I mean, listen, I remember showing up. To the studio. It's already on Moreland Avenue, so we in the hood. Mm-hmm. So I remember showing up one night, and he was just like, "Zay, I need you. I need you to come to the studio, but I need to finish these. I need to do two songs." So anytime me and Gucci do music, we doing it from scratch. I'm gonna come over there and make two beats, and he gonna rap on them from scratch. I remember uh, going over there, and it's pitch black over there, and ain't no cars or nothing outside. And I was like, "Dang, bro, you 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 here? You he's like, yeah, I'm gonna come to the door." I remember coming up to the door and it just pitch black and it's just him and some other dude in there I ain't never seen before. And it almost scared me like, hey, man, wait a minute. But I know I can't turn around and go home right now. This is my guy. So it's like I was feeling like, man, I don't know what Gucci on right now. But I just tell, I can tell he was like in a different space. He was in a dark space. But it'd be so hard for me to tell because while we sitting there talking and we're recording this, everything is normal. Mm-hmm. But just the scenery, if you look, and, and just the atmosphere, you could tell, like, okay, something else going on right now. Yeah, because I remember in his book, he's sort of describing the mentality, and that's when he had Scooter in there all the time, Migos, whatever. But he oh, also was everybody. describing it like like there was a ton of guns. and it, like Man, it's, I, I looked in the table. It was so many guns <laughs> on the table. And I'm looking like, okay, it's me and Gucci, and then somebody I ain't never seen before. Mm. I was just feeling like, man, I can't, I can't wait to do these songs and get up out of here. You know, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's how I was feeling. You yeah. know what I mean? I wasn't acting like that, but I was just thinking like, man, why did I come over here at two in the morning? I don't know what's going on. Right. And I know Gucci. Like, this my guy. He ain't never did nothing to put me in harm's way or make me feel, you know, that type of way. But, you know, I the Twitter thing had went down. I can tell, you know, I know Gucci. Like, you know, sometimes he going to be cool and level-headed. Other times he going to be like, oh, you know, he tripping right now. Mm-hmm. So... You know, that was one of them times. But all in all, I still felt, you know, comfortable with, you know, with being around him, even at that state. So, but I can tell it was a different mindset at that at that time. 
Yeah, it's kind of crazy because he goes in for like three years or something, and then he gets out, and then you did like over half of his first project out. Did that relationship just completely rekindle right away as soon as he got out? That's every time. Like when Gucci go to jail, you got to think he, Gucci went to jail a whole lot of times, you know, in in this in our career, and he'll always, you know, he'll call me and laughing and playing, and then let me hear what he wrote. Zay make a beat to this and that. So that relationship, so I knew when he got out, I knew exactly what it was going to be. He was going to call me first because I felt like, I think I felt and he he felt like the world know Gucci with Zaytoven. Mm. So even if I add another producer in, I got to add Zaytoven in or it's going to, it's going to look and sound like I'm not, I'm not in pocket or I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out of pocket. So. Yeah, I feel you. That's yeah, man. And now it's crazy too, because now his lifestyle is a lot closer to your lifestyle. Exactly. You see the Instagram stories of him coming home from the gym at like exactly. eight in the morning. Yeah. I'm like, this motherfucker's done working out at eight in the morning. morning. Are you kidding me? That's the guy. You big working out. You're into health and stuff. Definitely. You work out and eat good and everything. Definitely. Definitely. You look you know, like you probably eat pretty yeah, good. Yeah, I, I I take the kids. You know, I take the kids to school in the morning. So after the kids, it's, it's straight to the gym. Right. Mm -hmm. Is it hard for you? Because like you're talking about going and doing beats with Gucci at two o'clock in the morning. Is that something that you have a hard time with? Because a lot of times studio sessions go till eight in the morning. You're kind of at the point in your career where you don't ha you can let other people be on your schedule, right? Exactly. I don't do it now. It's I, like, man, these guys go to the studio at four in the morning. You know, three, four in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't like, do that. It'll mess my whole day up. You know what I mean? So I definitely don't do. <laughs> Definitely don't do that. It's yeah. like I send you the beats, but I ain't finna show up, you know, at that time. Do you enjoy that that process though of being in the studio with the artist and just cooking up on the spot? Is I that preferable it. in a way? I love it. And certain guys like Gucci, they don't like it no other way. Mm. You know, it's just the feeling or the or the action of me making the beat. Like I remember when he had Travis Scott when we did the song last time. Mm -hmm. He had Travis Scott over his house. And I could have, I was like, bro, I'm seeing some beats. I, hey, man, Zay, please just come over here. Just make us something. Just make us something in five minutes and you can leave. Right. You know, and see, he enjoys that process. And I think that helps him come up with, you know, ideas. It helps him, you know, come up with the lyrics even better because he's going off of my vibe and my energy, you know, while I'm making the beat. And it's weird because that, even for me, like, I've listened to that song a million times, but, like, knowing that you guys were all in the studio doing that together, that kind of does make it feel more special to me, too, yeah. just knowing how that recording process goes down. Travis Scott was tripping, like, <laughs> hey, man, did he just make the beat that fast? Because I had to go <laughs> and make the beat literally 10 minutes and leave. You, like, told your wife you were going to the store yeah, real quick? I had to say, like, I had to go over here. It's like, <laughs> I got to go, so I'm going to come over here and do it. I made the beat so fast. Travis Scott was tripping, like, man, did... He just come in here and make this beat in five minutes and leave. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Is there anybody in particular in the producer world that stands out to you as somebody that you really believe in? Is that because I'm sure you interact with a lot of producers all the time? Believe in far as their, their talent, their music that you think are really like gonna be legends or are legends unfolding right now? It's it's a lot of them, man. It's a lot of producers. Like uh like, you know, I have I always have to say Metro and Mike Will. Um, cause you know they just they didn't made they mark in the game like you know they didn't, I I believe that they gonna stay being successful mm -hmm. and 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 doing the music and you know I work with them all the time so I I watch them produce I watch them do what they do so uh but it's so many producers man that I feel like it's so dope and that's gonna be around and I'm scared to st I'm trying to think who <laughs> so I can you know. I mean, there's been like a whole generation of like Atlanta stars that sort of came after yeah. you, Metro, yeah. Sonny, all these Sonny, guys. Yeah, yep, all these guys. Like Sonny was the first guy to come over, and we were supposed to collab on the collaborate on the beat. But he came over and he just had a laptop, mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, how are we gonna collab on the beat? Like, how are we gonna make the beat on that? Lap? Like, where your oh, keyboard? Yeah. And, you know what <laughs> I mean? Real? Like, you know, that's when I start it start registering to me like, okay, it's different now. Mm -hmm. Like, you can produce differently now. When Metro come over the house to do beats with me. He just bringing his, you know, he just bringing his laptop. Mm -hmm. I'll be making a beat in one other room, give it to him. He'll take it in my other, like my B room, and finish making the beat. I'm like, well, dang, what, what did you use to make the beat? Like, how did you do that? Right. So it, it started teaching me, like, okay, it's different production styles now. It's different, different ways of producing. Mm -hmm. So, but all those guys are like, man, I'm, I'm really fans of all the new producers. 
For real. You know, one of the hottest rappers in LA right now, 03 Greedo, he gave you like a full on shout out in the chorus of one of the songs on his new album. So we've oh. been all singing your name a lot. Yeah, a song called Beethoven. And he says, I think, he says, I'll dog a bitch like Beethoven. Ron Ron is like my Zaytoven because Ron Ron is like his producer. So oh, I, I got to request that you listen to that because I got to listen to that. I got to lock you in with 03 Greedo because he, he's got facing to. some serious charges. He might not be on the streets for too much longer, but that would be probably fucking legendary as fuck. Come on, man. I I'm, got I'm to hook it up. Please do. Crazy. That's big. At this point, what motivates you in your career? Like, you just really want to be that guy? Like, what, is there any sort of certain accolades that you want to accomplish before you. Uh, are 75 years old and <laughs> it's, it's no accolades i still got the excitement of being a producer that you know, a sought out producer mm -hmm. you know and and these new producers they help help motivate me because if they going hard it just make me feel like okay i ain't going out like that i ain't finna just stop going hard it's like they inspire me to go hard and keep making music mm -hmm. i still want to be like when you mention these guys or when you pull up albums like okay well they had to get they had to get one from zaytoven too or zaytoven worked on that project too you know what i mean so i still got that fire burning in me mm -hmm. and then you know collabing like that was something new for me when i started collabing with different producers you know it just it just intrigues me it still they still you know keep my fire burning to produce yeah. Accolades or none of that. Like, you know, I didn't make I done done more and made more money than I ever thought about in my life of doing this. Mm -hmm. And I still enjoy, I still love getting up making beats. I still love producing for people and seeing what it sound like. I love that the new generation still like, dang, I need some I need to get something from you, Zay. Like I need to work with you. Like that that seeing you and Trippy just connect in that moment and have that mutual respect, even though I think he's nineteen or twenty. Mm -hmm. It's like multiple generations between you but just seeing you that guys does both. it for me yeah that you know did it why? for me too i was like man i'm happy as fuck this is happening here you know why it's because i remember the reason why i started working with Lil uzi or Lil pump it's because my son my son is 12 years old mm. so he listened to music and i'm like i don't even know where he listen you know where you get all this music from how you find out all these different artists and it's i know it's the cell phone mm. but you know it's like <laughs> Me working with Future and Gucci and all that to him is like, oh, that's okay. That's cool. You know, that's like old school to him. Young guys. He's been seeing them around and shit. Huh? Yeah, they, they been, come over to the house. Right. So, you know, they take pictures with them and, you know. Lil Pump ain't been to the house, so it stands Lil out Pump, a little. Lil Pump FaceTime him, though, you know. Really? Yeah. So, because I was like, Lil Pump, you got it. My son is the reason why I'm working with you. He the one that's like, Daddy, you got to do something with him. Right. Like, I get brownie points. I work with Lil Uzi when we did Too Much Sauce. You know, to him, now he's the most popular guy in the school because, mm -hmm. okay, he can brag that, oh, my daddy worked with Lil Uzi. Right. You know what I mean? That's crazy. So, yeah, and it's like, you have to like understand the kids to really understand rap music. Like, I remember I was interviewing Rico Reckless, and he got his eight year old son here, and he's watching Lil Pump, he's watching Tay K, yeah. he's watching yeah. uh, Mad Ox. You know, he's like, they, they really like, and you know how kids are, they watch the same video a oh, hundred oh, yeah, thousand times. Yeah. And then you start to understand, oh, this is why Gucci Gang has 600 million mm. video <laughs> plays on YouTube. Exactly. Mm. So that's that's another angle for me. Right. You know, it's, I'm still trying to impress my, you know, my kids because I want to be, you know, I still want to be cool to them when it comes to, you know, what they listening to. For sure. So, yeah. How did that pump song come about? You just reach out because your son was so into it? Well, or? they re it, ironically they reached out to me. Mm -hmm. So. My my son was telling me like Lil Pump. He showed me Gucci Gang. I didn't know. I really didn't know nothing about Lil Pump. Even though Gucci had already did a song with him, people had done songs with him. I really didn't know. Mm -hmm. But my son turned me on to him. And ironically, Pump and his manager had called me like, "Yo, yo you know, like we want to do something with you and this and that." And I was tripping like, "Oh man, you know what? I can't wait to do something with you." Mm -hmm. My son was talking about you, and I, you know, I sent Pump some beats, and immediately. He was like, you know, I remember he did a little uh, video of him jumping out the truck rapping to the Zaytoven beat. And I was looking on my Twitter like, oh, he going crazy. <laughs> I didn't, you know, I didn't know. I didn't really know like that. Right. I didn't know how big he was. So I'm looking at it like, oh, this guy going bananas. Right. Let me call him, send him some more beats and this and that. So, uh, and it was just instant, man. You know, we, we get to talking all the time. I'm sending him beats, you know, and now I'm working with him. So it makes it. You know, it makes it dope for for me and, you know, and for my son. And it just bring me to the new generation all over again. Beautiful. How long, you, you picture yourself doing this shit till the day you die? Man. 
if if I can. Yeah. <laughs> like I and you know, me being a guy that played music in the church, like I I just did a project with Lecrae. Lecrae is you know like the biggest gospel mm. rap artist in the game. Really, I yeah. have a look into that. Yeah, so looking look into it. Uh, me and him is dropping a project very very soon, but you know. I want to do different things like that now, you know, to expand my name and legacy. So, you know, it's not going to be just, you know, just making beats for people for their album, for their project. It's going to be the projects that Zaytoven put out. Zaytoven and whoever just did, a, you know, I got a lot of projects lined up like that. I don't even want to name all the names, but it's Zaytoven and, dang, Zaytoven did a project with this person. Zaytoven did a project with this person. Like how we did Beast Mode. Amazing. So, you know, I just did the Superfly movie that's coming out. Uh, June the 15th. So mm -hmm. I just did the music for the Superfly movie and I'm acting in there too. So all that stuff is just, it's, it's keeping my, my fuel, you know, fueling my fire. So when we talk about that song that you got with uh, Jeremiah and Ty Dolla Sign and OJ and stuff, is when in terms of you doing your own albums, you just consider that another way for you to be creative outside of just doing other people's beats and really like kind of put yourself first in a sense? Exactly. Uh, I felt like it was just, you know, it's it just timing for everything. I've been in the game for, uh, you know, my first big song was 2004. Here it is, 2018. I'm just now finna put out my own album, you know. So, and it, it just expands my my life in this music. I want people to look back at Zaytoven and be like, well, Zaytoven was in the game for, it, you know, mm. for this long and still relevant and still, you know, that's what I want my story to be. Not that Zaytoven was the hottest guy in 2013, but now he ain't really do too much after, you know, by 2015 he was over with. Because that's easy. That's, that's, easy. that's everybody. That's easy. You know, so I think for you to what, still be relevant, that's crazy. That's, that's crazy. really out of the ordinary. That's you know? what I, and that's what I want. I, that's what I thrive off of. Right. I'm a guy that ne I never had highs and lows in the music. I never was the hottest producer in the world at one time or none of that but i've been consistently being here where you got to mention me without every new hot producer you know i came up when it was shawty red and nitty right on the, you know that was kind of the, the, the era sort of before you in the sense yeah, right? yeah. Be pretty much yeah but you know that's when i started getting my name right so you know to to last when there's lex luger and mike will and sunny and metro or London or all the guys that's you know that's, that then came and making a mark in the game. Some guys came and and left and, and not here no more. So for me to still be one of those guys is what I thrive on. So that's what you know keeps me motivated. Amazing. Hey, I'm sure this is going to be super motivational to uh, a lot of the up and coming artists out there, especially the producers who, who understand your contribution. All these young producers out there are probably going to see this and be like. <laughs> that's the path right there. That's what I want to be doing in 14 years or yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's an honor getting to have the conversation. I don't know if you remember, I ran up on you at a little meet and greet you did recently. Yeah, and did yeah. the selfie, and I was like, I'd rather have a Zay track than a Dre Zay track. Tracks. Yeah, I remember. I remember. <laughs> is that a little offensive? Do, to, you ever worry that Dr. Dre might take that the wrong way? Uh, n Nah, you know, <laughs> it came from Gucci. I didn't say it. He said it. <laughs> for real. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, being on the podcast, man. Appreciate it, my guy. Hey, No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, Zaytoven in the fucking building. Another classic checked off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gang.